Well, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Is that okay? I'm a, a physician by trade and uh, a scientist as well. And I won't beat around the bush. I can tell you without a shadow of a doubt that you can avoid getting old with advances in molecular medicine and therapeutics and genetics, epigenetics. You can avoid it completely. You really can. You're some of the first to hear this. What you can't do, though, is avoid dying. And that's a bit of a problem. So the question then is, well, how long do you have left if you've got to die? And there's quite a few students here. Um, and if you're in your early 20s, I guess you're about a quarter of the way through your life. Um, so I don't know how it's going so far, but you're a quarter of the way through. And if you leave full-time education by the time you're, say, 25, 26, you're about a third of the way through. So the question then is, well, what are you going to do with it? Um, and are you going to change the world? Because I think that's what you'd like to do, and that's what we'd all like to do. It's what I'd like to do, and I think you can. Um, it is actually in your hands to change the world. But then the question is, well, how do you do it? Now, you are beautifully poised to change the world, but it isn't always very obvious how you can begin to do it. Um, and one of the ways I think that is most helpful is to think a little bit differently um, about everything. So what I thought I'd do, and I'm sorry it's a bit small, I didn't realise there'd be quite such an arena between you and the screen, is to give you a little lunchtime menu, some examples of dogma to dispute things that you really believe, that we all believe, which I don't think are true, and then show you some examples of some innovations that we use in my trade, which is medicine and medical training. Uh, a worked example of getting an idea to market, so a bit of entrepreneurism, if you like, and how we do that within medicine and the National Health Service. An example of a device that's on the way to market, and then I'll fess up and tell you how you can really avoid getting old, and you can. I mean, getting old is a disease, according to the Americans. It's not because they're Peter Pans. It's just because unless it's a classified disease, you can't get money to research it. And that's what they've been doing. And you can avoid it. So what about personal health? Now, I've got to scurry along a little bit, but I would say that breast self-examination saves lives. Now, we could do a little poll, and you could put your hand up if you believe this. Um, but I think I could probably predict that most of you think that breast self-examination would save lives or at least it wouldn't do any harm. Well, the truth of the matter is that it does do harm. It's actually bad for you. Um, how do we know this? Well, they spent a lot of money in Russia and in China. In China, 250,000 women working in factories taught to breast self-examination. 250,000 women not taught how to do it. Who died more? It was the ones who were taught how to do it. Why? Because they didn't reduce the risk of breast cancer because it's already spread by the time you could feel a lump. Many of my patients who are dying of breast cancer never felt a lump to start with. There isn't one to feel, but they're dying anyway. So breast self-examination didn't reduce the risk of dying from breast cancer. But all of those women found all these lumps and bumps and got worried. Uh, they went to their GPs. The GPs got worried. They biopsied. The biopsy histologist got worried. Then the surgeon took it out and they died on the operating table or something like that, of misadventure or anxiety caused by it. Breast self-examination is bad for you. The study's been repeated in Russia and elsewhere. What do we recommend that women do? Examine their breasts, yeah? Exercise is good for you. Do you all believe that? Exercise is good for you? Are any of you limping? Are any of you in the street, if you see any young person who's limping, anyone in the street who's got a bit of strapping about them somewhere, it's a laudable injury, isn't it, from exercise? Have you noticed that? They all exercise. And if you look at the number of injuries, and I'm sorry this is so small, but this is the injuries in the United States in, uh, over the last year caused by various types of exercise. It's got cycling, soccer, skiing, swimming, rugby. But up here, it's got exercise caused by exercise machinery. This is what you actually pay to use. You go to the gym, and you injure yourself, you twist your ankles, you fall off your treadmill, you fall, you fall backwards off your exercise ball, you do yourself a lot of injuries. This is a quarter of a million exercise-induced injuries a year. A quarter of a million. But anyway, even if it isn't good for you, at least it confers some metabolic benefits. At least you're healthier, aren't you? You're healthier? Well, um, you are, indeed you are. Glucose disposal, one of our indices of health, which is how you tuck away sugar into your muscles, is improved. How long is it improved for? Three days. So if you exercise religiously now, until you're, say, 70 years old from now, 
when you're 70 years old and three days, it will be as if you'd never exercised, <laughs> except that your jowls will be where your tits ought to be, your tits will be where your knees should be, your knees will be in a jar because they'll have been replaced. So actually, you don't get much benefit um, from a metabolic point of view from exercise, at least it's very fleeting, alas. Don't worry, you can lose weight if you exercise. Can you? No. Miraculously, your energy intake, your calorie intake, your appetite exactly increases to match your extra expenditure. So exercise doesn't help you lose weight either. Been beautiful trials in Canada, prospective trials of exercise, very difficult to do, beautifully done. Exercise is no good for weight loss. What about organic food? A lot of you are loosely eating, yogurt drinking people. Um, is organic food good for you? Well, if it's chickens, if they're outside, they're getting all kinds of infections that you really wouldn't want. Where if they're inside, they're probably not. And if you have food grown by a farmer using traditional, normal methods, then they'll be using insecticides, pesticides, and fungicides, all of which are very fleeting uh, activity, and they vanish as soon as they touch the ground. If you're an organic farmer, you use pyrethroids, which are very persistent and we don't know what effect they have on you. And there are increased fungal spores and fungal detritus in organic food. Uh, and we know that they've got carcinogens in. So I don't know if organic food is better or worse, and you might feel better, but the evidence would suggest that it's actually not quite as good for you. But I'm pointing the finger at normal people. What about our we believe stuff in the health industry? We believe a lot of stuff too. We think, for example, that diabetic education is good for people with diabetes. And diabetes now is really pretty complicated. You know, it's, uh, it's very common. You've got your exercise, you've got your appetite and your food intake to match to your tablets, to your insulin injections, lots of different things. It's really quite complicated. And we think diabetic education must be good. Well, if we do it earnestly and we do it well and enthusiastically, it has absolutely no effect on outcomes at all. There really is no, what do we do? So we do more of it and more of it, pretending that it must be doing some good. It's very disappointing. We even believe, maybe you all believe this, that hospital admission rates increase in the winter. That there's some with the cold weather, there's a bulge in admissions. There's no such thing, it's as flat as a pancake. Year after year, month after month, week after week, there's no change at all. And it's a piece of unshakable dogma. We even open extra wards in the winter because we think that the number of admissions increases, and it doesn't. And in fact, last year I was in a meeting in June with one of our administrators and I, I mentioned this. I said, well, it doesn't really increase. And she said, yes, it does. And she kind of batted me to one side. I'm, I'm very frequently batted to either to the left or to the right. And I was. And in her next breath, she said, now, as you all know, the winter pressure hasn't yet subsided. And this was in June. <laughs> doctors are responsible for all hospital acquired infections. Of course we are. Hospital is where doctors are. People with infections go to hospital. That's where all of the infections end up. We don't actually touch people very much as doctors. About 6% of all actual physical contacts. Otherwise it's the auxiliary nurses, the cleaners, the WRBS trolley, the visitors, other patients chatting, going from bed to bed. It probably isn't us. Because something's happened once, you've got to change everything in case it happens again. This has happened in school playgrounds. One child injures themselves on a wooden ear on a donkey. That's the end of ears across the country, if not the end of donkeys. And it's bad to be harmed. It's worse to be victimized. We worry about the shoe bomber, but we don't worry about flu. But flu kills about 400,000 people a year. And the shoe bomber has yet to kill anybody. And we're all all together in a little clump, all waiting with our shoes off, getting flu from each other while the bombing is not going on because it doesn't happen. And this is the most enduring dogma of all. Have you ever wondered why we, you know, the only time you ever sleep in satin sheets is when you're newly dead in a funeral parlor? Uh, it's fascinating. It's a really comfortable place to be dead. And the reason for it is that there was some hysteria in 1896 from the Association, the London Association for the Prevention of Premature Burial. It says what it is, it's clear what it is on the tin, really, but I mean, they just spread the idea that there are people being buried before they were really dead, and it's awful to wake up six feet under. Much better to have a nice place to wake up just in case it happens to you. And of course, it never happened, it probably never happened then. It certainly doesn't happen now, but that's why we have funeral parlors. It's literally because. 
of the London Association for the Prevention of Premature Burial. As if that's going to happen. And actually, in our waiting area a couple of weeks ago, I found this fantastic journal. It was for the patients to read. You can't see it, but it's got this wonderful thing. It says, um, my boyfriend didn't even know he was dead. It's one of the headlines, which I think is great. <laughs> the, the problem is that every stupid thing we do, of course, is a sensible thing that we can't afford to do. And even worse is that every sensible thing we do is another sensible thing that we can't afford to do even better. So there's all this health industry dogma, like hospital food is horrible. Actually, actually it isn't. It isn't so bad. Um, if you get food from a top restaurant and you serve it there, or you serve it on a transatlantic flight, or you serve it on one of our wards, you get exactly the review that you would expect from the circumstances in which it was served. So it's really interesting. Of course, we only serve people who are feeling sick. So it's hardly going to be ideal, is it? But it's actually pretty good. And medicine based on charity is better than nothing at all. This is the, the Lifeline Express that travels across India. It's a train on wheels. At one end, they're taking cataracts out of little wizened elderly people um, so they can see for the first time that their little great-grandchildren have had their cleft lips repaired. And you think, well, what's going on? Is that really good? Is it really sensible medicine? Is it a political toy? Is it a salve to collective conscience, a substitute for equitable health care? a plaything for the religiously inclined, a vehicle to decorate with foreign aid, a stimulus to local industry. Um, it might be a stimulus to local industry. Wherever it stops, you've got to get water and food on, you've got to get waste off, you need electricity, you need all of that kind of stuff. Or is it something to do with healthcare? And if it is to do with healthcare, why don't they do it in America? In the States, they've got 45 million people without healthcare. Why don't they have, you know, use their rail system and actually deliver some healthcare to all the people who can't afford it? It could travel to all those little out-of-the-way places. Why shouldn't they imitate what's done in India? Lastly, people are living longer. This is the most pernicious problem that we've got with the present government. People are living longer, therefore it's going to cost us more to look after them. Well, I don't think that's really true. If you look at these data, this is the lifespan over the last hundred years or so. Uh, and of course it's gone up enormously. And it turns out, and you don't have to be a brain of Britain to realise it, that you're only really old as far as requiring health care for the last two or three years of your life. So, you know, when I was a, a young medical student, that was in your 60s, early 70s. Now my ward, you know, I've left the ward this morning, there are people aged 80 is about the youngest and then 90. Every couple of weeks we have somebody who's over 100 years old and they're quite sprightly. And it's just the last little bit of their lives that they need care. And the data from the States is that 77% of healthcare expenditure, that's lifetime, your lifetime of expenditure on health, 77% of that is spent in the last year of your life. And 50% within the last two months of your life. And that's in, that's in the States. So it won't be quite the same here, but it's of that order. So we don't have more illness just because we've got more people who are um, older numerically, because they're not older physically. So how can we change things? We've got all this dogma weighing us down. We think we know what we're doing, we don't. How can we change it? Well, organ donation. Is organ donation allowing a loved one's organs to be used to keep someone alive? Or is it actually somebody else donating their entire body to keeping part of your relative alive? Isn't that really what's going on? Wouldn't that be a slightly better way of thinking about it? We've got ways of getting information to the point of use. In hospital, we had all of our junior staff not following our antibiotic protocols, for example. Um, they denied ever having had them. And we said, oh, yes, you have, you have. And it was on eight sides of A4 paper. But when we reformatted that onto this diagram and then reduced it to the size of a sticker, that would fit onto their name badges. And suddenly, they're following the protocols. It's a way of getting information across. And for some of our patients um, who maybe don't speak English, uh, we, we see them in clinic um, and we say to them, look, on this tablet, this is what you need. But if you get a sore throat, you need to stop taking it immediately. And when we next see them in clinic, we say, did anybody tell you that? And they go, no. So we tell them again. And the next time we see them in clinic, we say, we, we did tell you to stop, didn't we, if you get a sore throat? And they go, no. And we've got these little cards now which we can use, which are, um, they look like this, and they're, they're recorder cards. If you just press both buttons and you squeeze it, if you're lucky, you can make it. You just press both buttons and speak into it. So you, can, you just, so you can actually record a message onto it and give it to the patient if it's in Somali, you know, in Somali language or one of the Indian languages. And it's really very useful for that. So we can change the way we do things. 
They had an interview with a man who went up, one of the astronauts who went up to fix the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, and he's, uh, that had uh, kind of no user serviceable parts, that thing. Um, and he said, well, I practiced, I had a, I, I practiced. You know, we have this little more in medicine, you see one, do one, teach one. No, see one, yes, see one, do one, teach one, which is a bit terrifying because it's a really major procedure and it's going to happen to you. Um, and this guy said, well, I had this thing to do and they made me a tool and I used it and I used it until it was worn out and they had to make me another one. I did it thousands of times to practice it. And I thought to myself, how boring are you? And then after a little bit, I thought, well, wait a minute. If he was doing something to me, I'd like them to practice thousands of times before they ever approached me. So it was kind of an inspiration to make some training mannequins, which we make and we use uh, locally. This is an ophthalmoscope, somebody using an ophthalmoscope on the top left. If you've been to an optician, they might have looked in the back of your eyes with this little illuminated torch. And that's all it is. It's a light with a series of lenses in the same light path, so you can see the back of the eye. And you're supposed to see what you see in the top right there of the screen, which is the, the fundus, the appearance of the back of the eye. It's actually incredibly useful to do, but it's quite difficult for our medical students to master. Um, so what we do is we, we get ping pong balls, at the bottom right, there's one cutaway just to show you, paint the inside orange, and then put a little paper target in the back with random words at the end of each blood vessel. Um, and then on the front of it, we just stick a little um, lens from a single-use camera because they do actually throw them away. So I take chocolates to boots and they save these kind of camera carcasses for me. And that lens on the front of the camera is then stuck to the front of that. And they have to look through it, as you can see here, and read the words. If they can do that, then they can use an ophthalmoscope. And then we can show them some pictures of the back of the eye to tell them, to tell them what's going on. And understanding behavior is important. There was a big corporation in the States that um, did the politically correct thing and they asked all their employees what annoyed them. And it turned out that the most annoying feature of working there was that the lift seemed to take ages to get them to the, the right floor. And that's really difficult because lifts are very expensive. You can't build new lifts um, and you can't put bigger motors on them because it costs a fortune. So what they did in the end, they just put full length mirrors between the lift doors. And then what they did, they re-polled all the people a couple of months later and said, well, how's the speed of the lift? They said, that's much better. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> the right stuff in the wrong way. I'm always worried about teaching people things that might have the wrong effect. Um, this was the worst plane crash ever. Two jumbo jets w ran into each other on a, on a runway. One was crossing it, and the other one, ready to take off, just took off. And they played back the tapes from the uh, control room, um, flight control room. There was, no, there was no suggestion that it should take off. And what they figured in the end was that the co-pilot was a very experienced training pilot who was used to taking people up and training them on little aircraft. And he was used to giving the, the order clear for takeoff. And he must have done that. And that's what caused the biggest plane crash in history, really. So it's kind of learning the right stuff, but it having a, a paradoxically bad effect. And then also believing the evidence about what we, what we do. There was a little village in the country where a dual carriageway went down to one lane. And periodically, every year or year and a half, these great HGV lorries would plow into the first couple of houses and injure people. And it was a catastrophe. And they tried everything. They put up traffic signs. They put up flashing ones. They put up sleeping policemen, chicanes, those kind of rumble strips, the yellow lines that get more and more uh, short, you know, the spacing goes down. They did all of those things, nothing worked at all. Eventually what they did, they took away everything, including the white lines down the middle of the road, including the white lines on the side of the road. And for the very first time, all the traffic slowed down. For the first time, people treated it as a kind of a country lane instead of a road, and they all slowed down, and that was the cure. So it's the power, it's the opposite of what you think. This is how they changed the world, doing something the opposite of what you think. And this is just a little bit of our scientific dog, but a lot of the stuff that we believe as doctors is based on a technique called immunocytochemistry. You want to look at a protein in a cell and you stain that cell using an antibody. And these are some cells which are positive. You can see they're brown. So the sheet of cells with some brown cells. And if I said, well, look, what you've got to do is you've got to count those. And that'll give us an answer. You count them. And you start counting. Um, and there's a few of them up there which you can see. And then there are some which are kind of slightly more moth eaten. And then there are some which are really moth-eaten. I don't know if you can see, like this one, you think, well, is this one a really a cell or not? And there's one up there which is, looks even less. And strange to say, 
you probably wouldn't come up with the same number, but a lot of our understanding of medicine is based on stuff like this. Um, so that's really difficult to start with, but if we want to quantify the number of cells, how many cells in a sheet of cells are like this, then we have to what we call counter stain. So we use, we look at all the cells which are negative, which are the purpley ones, and all the ones which are positive, which are brown. And you look at that and you think, well, that's easy enough. I can count the ratio of them now. But if you start counting the brown ones, very quickly you'll start seeing beige ones. And you'll think, well, I don't know if those beige ones are really brown or they're just not. And you think, I know what I'll do. I'll repeat this staining, but I'll put more stain on or leave it for longer so that all of those beige ones go brown. Well, the trouble with that is that all the ones that aren't brown at all, or beige at all, start going beige. And you think, surely the whole basis of medicine, the whole basis of science, isn't built on stuff like this. And you know, it is. So here, look, which cells are positive? I've drawn these little cells, and you see the one at the top left there, the little fried egg cell, is positive, clearly. And the one on the top right is clearly negative. Um, and I've put them all on this little luminance staircase behind it. And actually, uh, they're all exactly of the same optical density. And you kind of look at them and you think, it just can't be. The one on the top left is the same as the one on the top right. And if I slide it across, it miraculously seems to change from a positive cell to a negative cell just because of the background. The same here, these chess pieces, it's not black and white chess pieces, they're actually identical. And the only reason that they look profoundly different is because of the cloud colours behind them. So if you look at the, the black knight, second from the left at the bottom, if I take the middle section of it and slide it up, it just miraculously comes. And the same with the king. If you look at the king, tiny bit slides up, absolutely vanishes. So they are actually the same. So you could look at a slide, try to extract information, be completely honest, and be completely mistaken about what you're going to see. And here, you know, I hardly need to tell you now that squares A and B are actually identical as far as optical density, because B is in a white square space and it's in the, it's in the, in the that shadow of a cylinder that doesn't really exist. And if you slide it up again, it's exactly the same color. So it's like this is a bicycle. You know, you think, well, this is a bicycle. It's got a very nice onboard entertainment system. And you think, that's fine. And you, the more you think about it, you think, wait a minute, there's something a bit wrong about this. It is a bicycle, but it's wrong. And the same with this train, this locomotive. It's clearly a locomotive, but when you look at it, you think, wait a minute, that's a shaving mirror at the front and a sugar sifter at the back. It's, it can't be right. It can't be quite right. So let me tell you a little bit about innovation and origin of ideas, how we can move things forward. Your eureka moments take a while in coming. They reckon you have to be immersed in your specialist area for about 10 years before you have one of these um, to produce some good work. And here's a worked example. It's not exactly a eureka moment, but I can tell you how it happened. Um, we doctors, as you know, um, and in diabetes, you get neuropathic. It affects the, the nerves uh, when you're diabetic. So that if you were walking out of here and you've got a little stone in your shoe, you'd immediately feel it, stop, take your shoe off, get the little pebble out, and you'd be fine. A diabetic may, may not feel that because it's affected their nerves. And one of the first things that goes is the sensation of vibration. So we test vibration sense to see if they're neuropathic and whether we've got to warn them that they'd be prone to injury. So we do. So we teach all of our medical students that they need to test vibration sense. And this is a little box of tricks that we give them. And you see there's some cotton wool balls for fine touch. They're neuro tips, the top right, those little red and white things about the size of matchsticks. If you pull the round bit off, it's got a point, the opposite of a hypodermic. It, does, it hurts and it doesn't make a hole. The testing for pain sensation. And uh, a tuning fork for testing for vibration sense. But you'll see it sticks out over the end. So the reason that there's no lid on this box is because it's broken off, not because it's been taken off for the, for the <coughs> photograph, just because it's broken off because someone slammed it shut. So it just so happened that my wife bought me this little raisin in 2006 in Christmas. And if you press that little button on it, it vibrates. I've got no idea why it should do that. It doesn't help anything at all. But it does, and I was shaving away thinking, well, this is fine. It's vibrating. And I thought, I know, I can use this instead of a tuning fork. If I make a new head for it, I can use it instead of a tuning fork. And then I thought, well, Gillette are not going to be very pleased with this. I better make the whole device. So I retreated to the shed, and over a period of about three months of various prototyping and fiddling around, I managed finally to make this little tiny device here. And if you press the button, the tiny little button cell underneath the button, and a little vibrating motor, the same as in your mobile phone, and it would vibrate. 
And I thought, that's it, it's fine. So what about a name for it? Well, you do need the right name um, for whatever it is you're trying to sell. Um, and tried all of these things and eventually came up with Vibratip. Remember, the Neurotip is the one for testing pain. This would be Vibratip, the same kind of size. Um, and there it is. Then you, it's all the practical issues about it. I can't just go and take it to a patient because there's all kinds of regulations. Um, and it's a type 2A device. It actually irradiates people with vibrations. So it's like an implantable defibrillating cesium x-ray machine as far as the regulations go. Um, so it's a, a bit of a problem. Um, and also then we took it to the legal people. They said, well, it's, it's been done before. It's a vibrating stick. It's, you know, it's done. So we thought, oh, that's a real shame. That's about six months of work. Game over. Um, and then I saw this advert on television for Audi cars, and it said 1,300 new patents on this car. And I thought, well, it's a car. Yeah, it's got an engine and wheels, and it's, 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 it's sorted. You know, how could it have patents all over it? So I went back and insisted that we get another patent attorney's opinion. He said, well, of course it's patentable. It's got a spherical head. It's switch activation at 90 degrees. It's got all of these things we can patent it. So I was free to canvas opinion. Very exciting. I had my little device. I could go and ask people about it. We had a patent on it. So I went to our podiatrist, our foot specialist, and I said, well, what do you think of this? And she said, well, it's not a tuning fork, is it? Uh, it doesn't, uh, it's not even a Riedel C for tuning fork, which is, a, which is a calibrated one to give the right vibration intensity. And it's too small to hold when you're wearing gloves, and she dropped it on the floor. So I thought, well, I know, I'll take it to a neurologist. So I took it to our professor of neurology, Neil Scaldi. I said, Neil, look at this. And he went, he went, we're traditionalists. <laughs> Which basically means you can take your little device and you can stick it somewhere. So anyway, so I asked my mum and she said, well done, dear. So <laughs> on that basis, we moved forward. Thank you, mum. And we've got some engineering help. A British engineer drew these drawings for us. And he said, this is what you need to do. You pull the end out, that switches it on. You push the end in, it switches it off. You have a rotate out tray, which is the kind of anti-bling thing. It's like a hearing aid, you know, you don't want to rotate. And all kinds of problems. Then he was going to charge us seven and a half thousand pounds just to draw it. Um, And then, remarkably, he shot himself in the foot. Um, And while he was in hospital, having the pellets removed, um, we decided that we just had to move on and get another person to, to, uh, he he did shoot himself. Um, We had to get some other help. But he did one useful thing. He he sent me this little photograph of a blue tack model of the the way that he thought Vibratip might develop. And on the basis of that, we changed it and I kind of drew it and I redrew it and I fiddled with it and we changed it and we changed the button cell size and all kinds of things went to a, a graphic designer who produced these wonderful graphic designs for the logo. It's, it's too small for you to see, but it says, typeface with the soft lines and rounded corners, accompanied with a refreshing green color, combined with the product to give it a friendly and harmless look and feel. The curvy typeface to emphasize the fluid shape. Blue and dark gray colors represent the clinical image. Or this one, the digital look, with the P shaped like the device pointing down. So we chose the one we wanted, then we put it in for the university competition. It was new ideas or bright ideas or some idea thing. Um, what would you rather walk on? A piece of baize, and on the right hand side, what if you couldn't tell? You know, a, some a bit of you know, gravel with some old nails in it. And that was used as a kind of a pitch to the, uh, to the judging committee, see if they agree. So here was the core concept. Tuning forks, a traditional method, too big to fit in a pocket, not available at the point of use, cold to the touch, you require pressure to impart vibration, bacteriologically high street, we go from foot to foot to foot, we don't usually clean them. Very expensive, designed to produce a set pitch, whereas vibrative, pocket sized, available, warm, vibrations imparted by light touch, it's hygienic, inexpensive, customizable, discreet in use, it's bling, it will win pocket room. That was the pitch, and then we took it to the new, um, engineers, they sent us that picture, free, gratis, and for nothing. And there's a real difference. So the appearances, I think, are very important um, in pitching and getting business. Then the colour, we had to choose a different colour for the, the logo. No one liked the orange. I liked orange. No one else liked it. Vibrant it with dark blue. As blue as blue can be. Professionalism, credibility, used by the pharmaceutical industry. The light blue, baby blue, used by the fashion industry, gives a more friendly look and appeal. Fantastic. And then finding the right people. That was the next problem. 
I'd given a, a talk up in the Midlands um, at, a, at a meeting arranged by a colleague, and one of the delegates happened to be a European brand director for Pfizer, and I was talking to him about this thing and the problems we were having. And he put us in touch with someone who makes brand reminders and services to medicine, you know, everything which has got a logo on it, you know, a logo on your pen, post-it notes with logos, they do all of that kind of stuff that's given away. And he came to see Vibrative and then put us in touch with the European marketing manager of Novo Nordisk, who make half the world's insulins, who bought some. So they bought 30,000 of them or something. It sounds like a thing for making money. There's not a lot of pennies come away, really. Um, but 30,000, and with that money, they were able to go to Shanghai and do all of the various paperwork things and actually get the thing manufactured. And it costs a fortune. I don't know how anybody can normally do this. $7,000 for electrical safety testing. It's got a button cell in it, and a, you know, a sealed unit with a button cell and a little vibrating motor, $7,000 just for that bit. And then finally a sample arrives, which is very exciting, in a little package. Then we had to make a, a nice magnetic lanyard so that we can actually unplug it, use it on a foot, plug it back up. And that was my original prototype, and this was the final one. And that's just come through. This is like taking maybe four years to get from one bit to the other. So finally we have a beautiful medical device, We've got trials on the device, it comes in a packet, it's CE marked, everything's lovely, the colour's right, it's called the right thing. So then you send samples out, we got this back from Head of Podiatry, Dear Vibratip, with a real C for tuning fork, you know the amplitude. Um, if your device can be made to vibrate with the same amplitude, it would be useful. As it is, it's rubbish. No clinical applications. Yours, CJ, head of podiatry, Northern Hemisphere, Universe and Beyond. And in fact, the whole of podiatry in Cardiff is run by this guy. So I wrote back, well, in exactly the same way that a large format camera might be really useful if you have it on you, if you don't, you're stuck with your mobile phone. Um, while absolutely accepting vibration with a calibrated tuning fork applied with controlled pressure may be best, it's not often available. Um, and Vibratip's the first standardized thing. So you send that back to them to try and change his mind and he sends back, oh, thank you for that, it's interesting. Have you got any that we can try? So you can actually kind of change people's minds a little bit by banding it back and forth, but it's incredibly slow. And you just see, well, kind of death approaching, while well, it's kind of not only passing through puberty, but you just think, oh, I can't remember. it's like five years now. An example two, very briefly before I finish, um, we have this real problem of nasogastric tubes. You may have seen people with these who are too ill or unable to swallow for some reason, have a little tube into their stomach, and it's very difficult to stick them in. And what happens, and I had a patient on the ward, and we put the tube was into the stomach, um, and when it's in the stomach, you, you can't be sure. So you have to send them down to x-rays, you get porters, you put this poor ill patient in the bed, in the lift, all the way down to x-ray. You x-ray them to make sure it's in the right place, you bring them all the way back to the ward, and then they pull it out. So you put it back in again, which is uncomfortable, and then you take them all back down to x-ray again, and and you know, it can happen several times a day, and you never do get any food into them. So it's a real problem trying to fix it. And if you fix it, their noses are greasy. The tubes are made of Teflon. It's a, not a match made in heaven as far as keeping it where you want it. And, and then you claw at things if they're on the end of your nose. So I've been looking at these patients and thinking, this isn't right. I wonder if there's anything we can do. Uh, and it's a very universal problem that skin is difficult to stick things to. If you look on the internet, you'll find endless people with kind of stickers all over the place trying to glue in all of their tubes. There's examples of exactly that. And not only nasogastric tubes, but all the tubes that we use. If you've been in hospital, you know you have a cannula put in. And we can't now. What we used to do um, is to bend the tube up, we used to put a splint on, and then we used to put some bandage around it. And now, because of infection control, we have to see, see the whole tube. So suddenly, it's hanging loose. And this is what we see. This cannula on the top left is the arm, the forearm going to the right, the shoulder to the left, and it's bent right back on itself. And you can see the tubes kinking um, always. And it blocks always the pumps which is delivering the food. They're always alarming. And if you go to the wards, it's like a Chinese monastery with the nurses running around pressing alarm cancels and all of these things. So these two novel solutions we've got, this one, a two-part anchor with a single adhesive tab underneath, um, and the displacement provides the interference grip to keep it where it's supposed to be. If you flex the two parts, you can get the tube out, and you can put the tube in and out any number of times, leaving it on the cheek. So you could apply it to the cheek and just put the tube in and out and in and out. It's pajama-friendly. If you have one on someone's forearm, 
with the thing, and they need to take their pyjamas off, you can just take the tube out, take the pyjamas off, plop it back in again. It really works nicely. So that's one of them. Shape channel contacts the tube around most of its circumference. It's secured by friction. No direct adhesion to the tube, so it's made of Teflon, but it doesn't matter. The absence of exposed adhesives limits dirt and debris. Um, you can release and reattach these without denuding the skin. I mean, uh, the, the blokes here won't have had much um, um, kind of depilatory, you know, kind of hair removing treatment, but I think the girls will know just how painful it is to be waxed or something. And that's what it's like if people keep sticking things to you and ripping them off. And the tube remains visible throughout its length. Um, and you can also annotate onto it. So all of these little things applied to the cheek, it can be out of sight. It can guide the tube down away from the sensitive part of the nose. It's really lightweight. You can make larger versions to do all kinds of things. And you can camouflage it so that this example, you see these people in, the, in Cribs Causeway and places with these tubes coming out. You know, it could be beautifully camouflaged so they don't feel so embarrassed. The design too, this is the one, you can see how it works. Just bend it round and you can clip it down. You can make all these lovely little shapes of um, ducks and um, butterflies and little teddy bears and things. And it's easy to apply with one hand, low profile, simple pieces. All these kind of sales things that you have to think of. But fundamentally, I go on the wards and I see these problems and just think you've got to be able to solve these. You've got to be able to do something about it. And that's the number one issue. Trying to make it amenable. If you've got a little child who's got a drip in, you'd love them to have a choice of stickers to have to hold it all down. So where are we? Where are we? Well, I'm wearing clothes that are made of cow and uh, sheep hair, worm silk, seed head bulbs, rubber tree sap. I've got no nanotech about me. It's really very disappointing. My clothes don't clean me, and I have to keep cleaning them. You know, we're just nowhere. We're so in such a primitive state, I can't tell you if you really think about it. I'll drive home tonight in a car. It's got its own petrochemical burning power plant in it. It's absurd. You know, it's a really valuable resource, and we're burning it. I've got to burn it. I've even got to steer it. I, I have to steer it. I, I have to park it. Me. And then I need to fill it with petrol and oil and water and air and all that stuff. And when I get home, it's ridiculous. It's got stones on the roof. It's got fired mud for the wall. The frame's entirely made from trees. It leaks heat like a sieve. Uh, in winter, it's too hot in the summer. The roof does nothing. It doesn't collect wind power. It doesn't collect any electrical engine energy. It just sits there. You know, and I'm supposed to respect it because it's keeping the rain out when it had this chance to do something useful for me. The walls don't do anything except to support the floors and the roof. The windows let light in, but they don't really modify the heat transfer very much. And I can't alter their transparency. Why don't I have a switch? Go black. Don't go transparent. It should be there now. So we're living, I think, right at the beginning of recorded history. We're right at the beginning. Imagine what it'll be like in 100,000 years' time, or 500,000 years' time. And we can look back at 500,000 years' worth of video uh, and information that we'll have at our fingertips. And we're right at the beginning. We blew it. We're here for such a short time, and we're alive now, for goodness sake. What a mistake. So can you change the world? Well, I don't know. I mean, the better you're doing in academia it means the more you've spent. The whole idea is not even getting a grant, it's actually spending the damn thing. They think you're wonderful, look how much I've wasted. Right? The better you're doing at business, the more you've created. So what I'd say is before you launch into anything, do the mind game um, before you get into the difficulty and the expense of it. I mean, even famous people get it wrong. Um, and Clive Sinclair built this ridiculous thing. You just think, Clive, no, don't do it. No, didn't anybody tell him? This is so stupid. And remember that many events have led up to the present. Maybe your idea has been considered and not pursued. And what difference is it going to make? Why hasn't it happened? If it's a really good idea, it should have happened. Why hasn't it happened? Did people start to do something but didn't progress because it was too much trouble to find a way forward? And one of the most important things to do is to find the right help. And I don't know how you do that. It just happens or it doesn't. Um, and if the venture capitalists avoid them, really. So add value to life if you possibly can. And fulfilling the description of your job may not be enough. You won't find it satisfying in the long term. You'll be a third of the way through your life maybe when you get your job. And, and just fulfilling it may not be enough. So you need to think of other interesting things to do. Because you don't have very long. Uh, altogether before you die. 
So this is a kind of a contortion of an old Chinese curse. The old Chinese curse was, may you live in interesting times. But now we don't have so much war and strife. It really is more like, let's make sure you live in an interesting time. Oh, and as for getting old, you can avoid it completely. You really can. You can just die young. And a lot of my patients do that, and they don't like it very much. And I think as soon as you think, a bit, think about it like that, then you look at elderly people and you think, what a success. You know, how have you managed this? How fantastic is that? What have you done in your life? So I wouldn't recommend necessarily um, trying to avoid getting old. It's really quite a privilege if you can. Thank you very much.